Firstly, I've been talking about I've been talking about one case on compact formation and when that is when that. Uh, is binding. Uh, Blue versus Ashley, this was the contract carried out in a pub, uh, the offer made in a pub to uh, Mr Blue. Mr Ashley on the uh, right hand side here, chairman of uh, Sports Direct. Uh, Mr Blue on the other side is um, previously financial controller of Sports Direct. Mr Ashley uh, was entertaining uh, in, in, a, in a broad sense, but he was actually entertaining some uh, suppliers uh, and he was doing that with uh, Mr Blue. And um, over the course of the conversation with the suppliers, Mr Ashley uh, made a, uh, a number of comments and he was actually making those comments to the suppliers. One of the statements he made was, um, he actually asked the question, how do I incentivise Mr Blue, my financial controller, to increase share price sports direct? If it goes from £4 to £8, I will be like a billionaire. I ought to pay him £10 million. And the suppliers, there was a bit of conversation, the suppliers came back to the conversation and said, you know what, I think you ought to pay him £20 million. To which Mr Ashley said, that sounds more like it, tell you what, split the difference, £15 million. Sometime later though, the way it's reported, the share price did indeed increase up towards the £8 figure. The question comes, was the contract enforceable? The reason the contract wasn't enforceable wasn't because it was oral, because it was, it was spoken, it wasn't the fact that it was in a pub, it wasn't even the fact that Mr Ashley didn't intend to make an offer at the time. That's irrelevant and that's the important takeaway I think from the uh, case from the case really. The reason that the contract wasn't uh, valid was it was uncertain. The contract had been, ha had been framed in such a way that um, Mr Blue was required to increase the share price and that's not something that one person alone can do and there was also no time scale within which he was supposed to do it. So given it was an impossible contract to execute it was held not to be a valid contract. There are some things that you need to put into your contracts if you are going to comply with GDPR, you should be doing that now because we know it's coming and uh, if your contract is going to continue after May 2018, you need to put that in now. Typically, at the moment, of course, we have the Data Protection Act. That will be repealed when the, the GDPR comes out. What is changing under GDPR is, of course, data processors will be under obligations under GDPR. So they will have uh, statutory obligations themselves. Now there are some general things, subject matter and duration of processing, nature and purpose of the processing, type of data and category of data subject, and obligations and rights of the data controller. Those are the things I would suggest are probably in your contract anyway. The subject matter and duration of processing, nature and purpose of the processing, type of data and category of data subject, and obligations and rights of the data controller. But there are also some specific obligations. Now hopefully these are all in one article. Article 28 of the GDPR, sets out the things that must be covered in uh, your contract with your processor. It's one of those bits of legislation I wouldn't shy away from. As a processor you can only act on documented instructions. Uh, you've got to take technological and organisational measures to comply with the rights of data subjects, subject access requests, keeping the information secure, but also this um, right to be forgotten, which is now a right of data subjects as well. No sub-processing, processor can't sub-process and that if they do sub-process it will be on the same terms. You need to make sure that everyone uh, who accesses the data is under a duty of confidentiality. Uh, you must put in there the obligation to return or delete the data on the end of the contract and you must make available all information necessary to demonstrate compliance. Besides the law though, uh, there are some practical things that you ought to think about. What else do you need? Uh, in terms of if you're going to comply with the requirements on processors, then what, e what else do you need to do? You might also want to consider what time limit you need your processor to uh, let you know of any security breaches. You as controller will be required to uh, notify the ICO and in some circumstances the data subject within 72 hours. Um, do you, how quickly do you want your uh, processor to respond? They do have to do it promptly, uh, without undue delay, but you might want to specify a time. Now, of course, it's an interesting one, this, because you've got 72 hours from the point that you're aware. Now, an approach 
you probably want to take is to know as soon as possible so that you can deal with the thing as soon as possible and to stop things happening. If you're an in-house lawyer, the sorts of issues in-house lawyers are facing now, they are, uh, they are, if you're, if you're not careful as an in-house lawyer, you can get pigeonholed within the business. You're the legal person. You're the person rubber stamping the contract. You're the person being asked again and again for the same sort of advice. And actually a lot of that potentially could be outsourced, potentially could be uh, sent elsewhere. So it was all about looking at the skills needed to be a strategic advisor. How do you get up the food chain in terms of giving that sort of strategic advice? How do you have an impact upon the board when you're speaking to the board of directors? How do you make sure you're invited back to the board? How do you make sure that it's well received? Um, and also, how do you measure um, your value as an in-house lawyer? How do you make sure that people know what it is you do and why you do it? Because if you're not measuring your own value, you're likely to be judged on other people's values in terms of cost and time and turnaround times and things like that where that, that misses some of the essential points of an in-house lawyer, really, and so measuring it is, is absolutely key.